Okay, we're starting recording. Let us know when we go live. I'm going live in a second if I can find it. There it is. Okay. What the heck? Waiting for live video. It was just there. Why is it not now there? It's just processing. Yeah, I'll send a message to everyone. In the yeah, morning. send a message that just tell them once, one minute. Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> I don't know if I have to do this over because it's now it's not connecting. Okay, do it over and then just start it right away. My father was used to run TV and radio, so I'm so used to like, people get stressed, but I, I didn't used to watch them and everybody was like, keep your calm. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be fun. I I'm the same, I, cause I work at the, I worked at the San Diego Asian Film Festival. And uh -huh. like, oh, it's so I'm like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. okay everybody, we're, it's, it, we're live, we're going. It's live, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> It makes me think of Jen when you um, have your music as people come in and so kind of like soothing, get in the mood. So it sets the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I could play music if you want. <laughs> okay. And that gives a little bit of time okay. for, for Jens. I'm good to go. Okay. So am I hitting? Yes. We're going live. Go live and then we're going to admit the students. I'm going to share my screen with your bios. Well, maybe I'll introduce myself first. All right. Let's bring everybody in. Who's going to admit? You should let them know too that we're recording since we already hit that just so yes. people know. Okay. Who wants to click admit? Oh, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. So I think we're live now uh, on our Facebook oh, yeah. Mesa College Art Gallery page. And I want to welcome everybody to this um, fantastic uh, conversation and presentation by artists Rissel Javier and Wayne Martin, Martin Belger. And um, this is part of a project that we're doing as a collaboration between um, several learning communities in our, um, in our college, including Chicano Studies, the Mesa College Art Gallery, Capua Learning Community, and Work-Based Learning. Um, so as everybody settles into the uh, Zoom room, I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Um, so my name is Alessandra Moctezuma. And I'm the gallery director at San Diego Mesa College. And the gallery is closed, but we are uh, continuing some programming, um, offering uh, ways to highlight artists and have them um, work with our college community. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited to welcome today artist Rissel Javier and Wayne Mar Martin Belger. Um, and this is also going to be part of a larger project where we're gonna do a sharing of, of projects by the students. Um, so I'm going to talk, the, the title of our um, lecture is Traversing Through Rituals of Remembrance, a Celebration of Our Community and Cultures. And this all started because I wanted to do a virtual Dia de los Muertos Altar uh, which is something that we do in person at Mesa College every year. And my Chicano art students work on that project. Um, and I was talking about that with uh, Caitlin Choi with work-based le learning. And then we met with Professor Jennifer Derulo, who also works with her students with issues of rituals, tradition, uh, cultural traditions and remembrance. And, um, and we started um, brainstorming about the Baldic Bayan basket. So, so we're bringing two artists together that work with ritual and remembrance. And I'm going to just give the floor to the artists because they've, um, they're going to be engaging in a conversation about their works. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Wayne Martin Belger and then I'm going to um, ask Professor Durillo to introduce Rizal Javier and then we'll move over to um, our, the speakers. Okay. 
So Wayne Martin Belger is an unconventional fine art photographer that uses historical artifacts and processes as his medium to make intricate four by five camera cameras that are hand tooled from blocks of metal and used to engage with underserved communities, highlighting current social and humanitarian issues. As a student of linguistics and comparative religion, Wayne followed a path to explore the roots of beliefs, passions and truth as told through alternative and historic forms of communications. Since 1998, Wayne has created 15 camera photo projects focusing on subjects like the Abrahamic religions, corporate greed, and HIV. Projects have taken him to India, Israel, Palestinian territories, Syria, Kashmir, Turkey, the refugee camps of Lesbos, Greece, Mexico City, Tijuana, Standing Rock, North Dakota during the Sioux DAPL standoff in 2016, and most recently with the Us and Them project, Wayne lived and traveled with indigenous Zapatista rebels in Chiapas, Mexico. Wayne's work has been featured in many magazines and newspapers, such as the Smithsonian Magazine and Photo Pro Magazine. So we're really honored to have him join us today in this Zoom presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Durillo so that she can introduce um, Rizal Javier. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Professor Durillo, and I have the distinct honor, and I'm very humbled to um, introduce Rizal Javier. Um, if we didn't have this mashup of our two events, I feel like I would have never learned about this um, amazing artist, and I would have been very, very sad. Um, I love learning about um, our Philippine X community and, and you know, their their arts and things like that. So I'm so happy that she's here. Um, so Rizal is a San Diego based artist and educator. Her work explores topics in identity, memory, culture, and human relationships. As a first generation Filipino American, Rizal uses her art practice to dissect her identity and that of the larger Filipino American community through the research and creation of art projects. Her art is grounded in social practice with the intent to engage the public and to build a dialogue on topics that are often too difficult to discuss or understand. For Rizal, art is a way for people to build communication skills and a sense of community. Rizal's recent work is influenced by migration, travel, and family origin. Through intense archival processes, she is reclaiming her own history. She is currently working on a photographic project called Almost Home, which explores the similarity in histories of Mexico and Philippines. These combined landscapes explore the meaning of family and intuitive need to be home. Rizal explores social and historical issues of displaced identity, ideas of misrepresentation, and impermanence. So we're very, very lucky to have her and Wayne here. Um, so we hope you will enjoy this event. So now we'll invite um, Wayne and Rizal to present, and um, they will be um, talking to each other about their work. So welcome, Rizal and Wayne. Hello. Am I here? Hello. Hey, Wayne. Hey, Rizal. How are you? Long time no see. <laughs> Long time no see. And also, I love your backdrop. Your backdrop's far more entertaining than mine. It's, uh, Thank you. It's I'm transporting me. Um, I'm in my bedroom right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have tuk-tuks or the little carts in your bedroom. That's really cool. So, um, how would you like to start, Rizal? Um, I just wanted, I wanted to clarify with Alessandra, you, um, you had shared my videos, correct? Alessandra? Um, I had my students look at your website. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Yeah. So, um, I, I think, or what, I, I think we could start with you, Wayne, or do you want me to, uh, since they didn't watch the video, I could share like one, one minute, like quick one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's do that. Sorry, I, let me pull it up really quick. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm really um, excited. Um, Professor Dorelio gave me a very beautiful opening um, and uh, I will just say that means a lot because I do feel very invisible most of the time. Um, and something that's very special today is it's the first day of Filipino History Month, which I just wanted to share. Hmm. So thank you 
um, everybody for making me feel seen. Um, okay, so I am going to share my screen and this is a one minute quick video just on um, the project Almost Home. And I think it'll give you a good idea of um, why I, I use the ball cleaning service in the first place. And so let's do that. Here we go. Computer sound, share, and... These images kind of have a sound for me. When I think of Senegal Hassan, I hear the footsteps of people and like the vehicles, like the tricycles and the motorcycles and the cars. I hear those things like when I look at the photo. It feels like a, a simulation of that space. Wallpaper is about furnishing your home. And my grandma's house, it's like the hub of my family history. I think by including my grandmother, there's a little bit of a dialogue that's starting, like, why are these landscapes important to me? It helps me reconnect with my family. It's like the only place that I see that shows like evidence of like my dad's childhood. And so my hope with this project is that I get closer to that place that I feel like is home. As I work on the project and I'm looking at the images, it's becoming so crystal clear that I'm looking for a place to be and that I'm not there yet. Um, thank you for allowing me to share that. Um, Beautiful. Thank you, yeah. So. Um, I felt that um, when I was looking at Wayne's work, sorry, just to make sure this doesn't play again, um, that I saw some parallels, um, like with that particular project, I felt like the room was a box, right? And that um, what I was trying to do was make this little world. Um, that belongs what, I, what I loved about it too, I mean, I'm not even really knowing your history with it, and it's before I talked to you um, about the project, I really, it had a real like reverence or a real like um, shrine type of feel. Almost like the, your, the rooms became altars to, to your family and to your focal point of, um, you know, where you came from. And uh, it kind of reminded me of church. And uh, I just thought it was a really beautiful way to, to approach that connection. And uh, yeah, I really love the video. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting because in our, like, Wayne and I had a conversation uh, last night and I'd mentioned, um, yeah, it did feel kind of like, like when, I, we, when the exhibition happened, it kind of did feel like church. Um, my grandma's going to hate me if I say this out loud, but I don't typically go to church. <laughs> um, and so um, I found it very interesting, um, not on the opening day, but as people visited the exhibition, that they would show up and there was like a stool inside the, the gallery space and people would just sit there for a really long time. And I was like, why do they look like they're praying? Um, and also, so, yeah, yeah, it was very right. interesting. I felt this like spiritual thing kind of happening. And then I knew the project was maybe a, a little bit bigger than myself at that point. Also tell that story of uh, how people started dressing up in, in coming to the uh, installation. Yeah, yeah. So um, the exhibition was up, it was up for like a month. And then towards the end of the exhibition, I found um, more Filipino and Filipino American families, like actually multi generational families showing up with their grandparents, the parents and the kids. Um, and they were dressed up in their formal clothing. So they were coming in wearing um, um, you know, like dressy Filipino clothes, formal clothes that are only typically used for holidays or special events. 
And um, one, one person, um, I just distinctly remember, she was like, thank you so much for letting me go home, even for a moment, um, because I can't afford it. It's not something that I could typically do. And she said, even for a moment, I got to go home and I remember like myself um, back in the Philippines. And that was a really special. So it was a nice one. You could offer that, yeah. You know, through your work and through your vision. Um, yeah, after you told me that too, I was kind of wondering if it was like, yeah, you because know, you dress up to go to church. And my first feeling was this like, you know, a shrine or an altar, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, yeah, I wonder if like subconsciously at some level that's like their feeling. So you dress up and you go to church. You know, it was, uh, yeah, I thought it was a beautiful gesture to what you created too. So. Yeah, I think also just also in the spirit of Filipino History Month, I think um, maybe, um, I know for my family dressing up is a big deal. <laughs> my dad is a flip flops kind of guy. So um, getting people to dress up means there's an event. And then it occurred to me, um, there's never been a show on Filipino Americans here in San Diego. So that's why I started to think like, wow, this is, this is an event. Um, Carmela Prudencio did this curation of this beautiful show and we're being seen in ways that we've never been seen. So it's great. <laughs> Where was the show at? It was actually at the front, which was even more awesome because the project itself, uh, so this, the picture behind me is part of a larger exhibition called um, Round Trip. And uh, the, the work actually traveled around in, Me uh, in Mexico before it came to the States. And so I thought, what a perfect place to land the project once it crosses right in San Ysidro, right? Um, where the people, um, I feel like that's um, part of the borderlands, right? And uh, the project is definitely talking about that, um, a different kind of border, but I hope that um, the show is seen by the people that need to see it, which was really important for me. In your installations, <coughs> sorry, all congested, I'm sorry. Um, your installations, they're paste ups or how do you, how did you create that? I mean, you said there was wallpaper and you know, wallpapers like are in homes, but it was, uh, and so it, it's it's a it's an installation for a, speci uh, a uh, site specific installation, correct? Yes, yes. Actually, that's a great point. Um, so I just think, like in my normal art practice, that I've always tried to question um, the two dimensional space because uh, a photo is typically used, right? Like as a as a the photo as we see it, like a photo piece of paper or a photo on Instagram or something like that. Yeah. Um, another reason why I, I think I'm really connected to you, Wayne, is that I try to think of the materials, right? What are the materials that I'm using that relate to the photos? And so um, one, I was really fortunate from Francisco M. May to have the space. I had the idea for a really long time, but when I told people like, hey, I want to put wallpaper in your gallery, they're like, no, <laughs> like you can't do that. <laughs> and I was like, damn it, like, I think this is a great idea. I want to try it because I want to make people feel like they're coming with me. And when you have a yeah. frame, it takes you out of the space and it reminds you, oh, I'm in a gallery. Yeah. Or I'm it isolates it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm sorry, I lost track. What was the question? <laughs> I was so good. No, as far as it being um, site specific. Oh, the wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the site specific. Um, so one of the things was I went to the space and I remember speaking with Francisco and I thought, wow, I could see Mexico from the window. And mm -hmm. so when I started thinking about my images and how they were like these diptychs, so like this side is the Philippines and then like this side is Tijuana. Yeah. And I thought like, wow, what a cool way to play with the installation where the work on the US side is the Philippines and we're facing Mexico like through the window. Um, and so, yeah, I thought, um, let's blow it up. I asked Francisco like, can I cover this whole gallery? And I love this space because he was like, yes, please. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, what a fun, um, it was a fun installation and it was collaborative. So actually a, a couple of Alessandra students helped me install the show. And um, it was a great experience to um, kind of do all that storytelling while we put the wallpaper up. So it's kind of like building a house, it felt like. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I like how you're, um, I didn't know that about Tijuana, that you could see Tijuana right there too. And I like that, you know, you're just, it's Tijuana's per participating in the installation, you know, with the Philippines. 
So. so it's nice to have that. I'll, I'll show in my pictures later um, kind of what it looks like from the outside of the building, but it is very cool um, to go inside a gallery and then be discombobulated because you're outside again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish I could have seen it. I would have loved to have seen it in person. Well, but, we'll, uh, we'll connect, Wayne. Maybe we'll have a show together. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be wonderful. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like something that really connects my work to Wayne's is like, even in this space of the wallpaper in the video, you can see I really concentrate on objects. Um, you'll see like a window or um, slippers or things like that. And maybe at first glance, they might not mean um, too much, but I know um, definitely right when I saw Wayne's work that objects are very important to him and that they hold a lot of symbolic meaning. Um, yeah. So yeah, Wayne, I'd love to hear more about um, like how you even uh, pick objects and like, I feel like they need to know how many objects are in your studio. <laughs> oh, man, the studio is crazy. Um, it's, I mean, I have, well, I'm, I'm actually, a, uh, my studio's in Tucson, Arizona. I'm in a 4,200 square foot diaper washing factory from the 1930s. And uh, the back part of it is my machine shop and the whole, and a dark room for, you know, photography. But I, then I have boxes and boxes of things. Like I have boxes of teeth, um, a huge box of just wish bones and just all stuff to, to um, create a piece. And those objects just end up being, um, you know, the focal point of the piece. And sometimes you have, have objects for, you know, 30, 40 years, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this will be good for the focal point of this, the intention of this piece. So yeah, you should come over sometime. The, it's an interesting, interesting studio. Should I share my screen or? Sure, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Up. Oh, wait, you guys got it? Or did yeah. I present is at the top right yep all righty um oops yeah i'm still oh, see okay my job i make cameras out of different objects that relate to the subject they're going to photograph um, i'm also an analog guy so forgive me on the computer thing if i kind of mess up here and there because i'm using the oldest camera ever made it's uh they're actually pinhole cameras, which are cameras that have no lens whatsoever. It just has a hole in the front of it that is the size of an actual like pinhole. And then film goes inside. Um, this project is called uh, the Third Eye Camera. It's actually a 150 year old human skull. Um, light comes in that bindi in the middle with the gems and the silver and it, uh, exposes four by five film on the inside of the camera. And the camera was um, originally from England and it was part of a doctor's anatomy kit where in the uh, early 1900s, you had to have a full set of bones to be able to study medicine. And this friend of mine who was in England said you know, he had all these bones up in the attic from his uncle. And I found it kind of fascinating. And then I wanted a project that was gonna to, uh, to study the subject of decay and why people look at decay as um, bad or, or something you kind of want to push away. And so I thought, you know, a human skull is kind of like the symbol of decay or transition. And so through that study of transition, I, you know, I wanted to make the skull into a camera. And the, uh, and I also a little bit of background too. I was raised a good little Catholic boy in, in Los Angeles, but we have a, uh, Santeria um, influence in our family, like my aunts and uncles and grandparents and stuff were all believers in Santeria. So we always had a lot of shrines and altars around. And I connected with how um, the shrines were always created for an intention. And you would create the shrine um, partly from you and partly from the intention. So um, like in Santeria or Voodoo, it, it doesn't, I mean, there's nobody telling you this is exactly the way you gotta do things. You create your shrine that you connect with. 
So this was a process of um, this camera project came about to study um, just interpretation of decay. Oop. This is the side of the camera. Film goes in the top there, in that little top slot. And also there's a uh, viewer in the back of the camera where you can look into the uh, camera through the back of the skull. The first, uh, well, the photo series I've been working on is The Beauty of Decay, which um, is homes. And that's kind of why I really kind of connected with the, with the um, almost home uh, you know, project with the uh, wallpaper and stuff. I was like, I, I, I just have a thing about home <laughs> and how special it is. And then when people abandon, this, this is a house out in the desert in California, out in Wonder Valley, kind of by Joshua Tree. But, you know, people come into it and they build this home and create this home. And then they just kind of leave it at some point. And partly because there was no electricity, no water in the majority of the homes. And they're in the middle of flat desert. But um, I just found it really interesting how the homes are slowly coming back to the earth. And I wanted to document that. This is one of the photos from it. That's a photo of actually the house that the camera was just in front of. And what I do is you know, I'm making more shrines. Um, the, all the artifacts you see around that photo, those are all from uh, inside the house and laying around the house. So I collect artifacts that are actually relevant to that house. And that's the interior of the house. And those are all items I found inside. So we're photographing houses, yay. <laughs> and that's the uh, installation. Um, this was actually in Los Angeles recently. It was this year at the, uh, at the TAM, the Torrance Museum of Art, or Tor Torrance Art Museum. Yeah, that would make TAM make more sense. Uh, but it's, it's a wall that I completely constructed out of um, wood and plaster uh, for the exhibition, for the installation. And, and talking about altars too, being a good little Catholic boy, the, it, all my installations kind of break down into a Catholic shrine. So you have kind of like the Godhead, the figure, a Godhead figure at the top, which is that Jesus painting that I found in an abandoned homestead. And then you have the sacrament, which is the camera, which is sees everything. And then the mirror behind it, you know, shows its, its reflection and your reflection at the same time. And then hanging below is a plumb bob, which is like the uh, altar stone or the grounding feature of the um, sacrament. And then on the sides will always be the saints. And any questions? <laughs> um, this is it. Rizelle, are you there? I'm here. Oh. I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't hear you, Rizelle. I saw you moving. Uh, this is another skull camera. Um, since you know this, uh, the focus of this is uh, you know like a relics remembrance. Um, in altars, you know, I'm bringing up these two projects. I've made 15 different projects so far. This was another skull project, obviously. It's called uh, Yama. And in Tibetan Buddhism, Yama is the uh, Tibetan god of death. And he sees everything. So this camera, I actually made into a, this skull into a 3D camera. And each eyeball is pure gold or the pupils with silver eyeballs and then bronze. And a divider goes down the middle of the camera and it creates two side-by-side -side images. So it makes a real three-dimensional um, stereo view of what it takes a photo of. And with this project, I, I um, wanted to photograph or I wanted to study what modern incarnations of deities and icons would look like today. Like if, if, you know, if, um, you know, an icon, a deity from the past, uh, from history came back, what would they be doing today? And so that was the project with this. Wayne, yeah. I, um, 
I was just showing my students last um, Tuesday some, or maybe it was last Thursday, some images of the um, pre-Columbian skulls. You know, the Aztecs used to um, uh, do a lot of embellishment of skulls with pieces of turquoise, or they would insert like onyx on the eyes. So I see, I, I was wondering if you looked at that at all when you, or you, you know, had that at all as a reference when you were creating these. Oh yeah, that was a huge influence. Um, yeah, I, I, whenever I get into a project, I do an incredible amount of research. I mean, sometimes I'll start on a project and it might be a year later before I even start on it. I'm just collecting and doing research. And then the cameras take about a year to make. So I'm even still doing more research on that too. But yeah, the, all the turquoise in the skull was definitely, um, that's where I got it from, from that feeling. And it's, uh, and you know, all, and it's kind of like the practice of sensory or voodoo, you know, you kind of take whatever feels right for the right path of the intention. And so, you know, looking at those images of the pre-Columbian skulls, I was, you know, it just really connected with this project. And so, yeah, correct. I mean, that's exactly where it came from. And then there's a little bit of like, you know, Hindu belief because it was a Tibetan monk's skull. Um, you know, I tied in some Tibetan um, items. There's actually, in this photo, I don't know if you could see it, there's, this is with a camera open. It's, it's air powered and there's an air tank right below. So you hit a switch under the jaw and the camera opens up and you put the film in. But there's these four holes in the copper. You can kind of see it in the upper left one. There's the Hindu god Brahma. And he's kind of like the pinnacle of the uh, Hindu gods. And he's actually at the pineal gland <laughs> inside the skull. Um, so there's all different um, artifacts in the project and in the skull that relate to the subject I wanted to focus on. And, um, and you know, going back to like seeing like different things that you connect with as far as ritual or uh, you know, different, um, different relics that you connect with you, that, that totally comes from my upbringing. Um, I was telling Roselle uh, yesterday about, uh, there was a voodoo priest who came from Haiti and we went to an altar that he had created. This is when I was really little. And he, it was more of a, like an aggressive altar. And so he, and like the intention was a little bit more aggressive. So around the altar, he had all these photos of saints and they were all upside down to like rile up the saints. But he had stuff from Judaism. He had stuff from the Masonics, from Masonic temples. He had stuff from Catholicism. He had stuff from all kinds of things because it connected with him. And he felt something through those objects. So his focal point of intention was amped up or amplified due to these things. But the main figurehead, the main thing that was in the middle of the altar for this like a little bit darker kind of intention was a giant piggy bank of Darth Vader. So, the idea was, you know, you make it personal through you and what you connect with. And so the work that I've been doing, you know, I feel I'm making it as part of me and as part of um, the subject itself. And then we meet in the middle with a communal bridge. That's great, Wayne. I really connect to, um, you had mentioned like uh, an object having such like a deep kind of huge impact on someone, even if it's like, uh, we talked the other day, like an onion, <laughs> and it's, and yeah. it's yeah. something very crazy, but you know, it makes well, I thought that was a beautiful crazy. story about the onion. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have to be much, right? But it's about the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, and it, it, it's been interesting too, with this project, since the cameras are so different and they're actually made for the subject, the subjects come out of the woodwork to be engaged with me. Where a lot of times, you know, photographers, like when I was in the refugee camps of Lesbos, Greece, they wouldn't let photographers in. But I got to stay there for months because I had an object that was made for the refugees and from the refugees to connect and be a communal bridge between us both. 
And so, you know, it, it was a different approach, but it was, you know, an approach I learned at a really young age, um, you know. Um, yeah, this is, this is actually one of the photo shoots. So this is um, the part of the series. Uh, this is my photo shoot in Montreal of Saint Margaret Bourgeois. She was the patron saint of Montreal and she, was, she opened and ran the orphanages of Montreal. And today she would just be kind of a street person with marionettes um, because you know, she was considered just one of the most important people in Montreal where today like people that are so doing social work just don't have that um, type of, uh, they're not looked at the same way anymore. And that's the finished photo. So like I said, it's two side by sides through the eyes taken at the exact same time. So that's a 3D image taken from the uh, eyes of the skull. And that's Kali, the Hindu goddess Kali. Um, she in, Kali is generally walking over Shiva, the Hindu god Shiva, but here she's walking over another woman, has a bomb pack around her waist and actually holding up a baby and um, a tree and a book. And that's the shrine again, where you have the Godhead at the top, which is a woman, um, sacrament, which sees everything, saints on the side, and then the grounding stone in the middle or the uh, altar stone. And this is the plumb bob. It's actually a real human jawbone in sand with mercury and my blood mixed in the uh, middle of the thing. Um, do you want to talk about some of your work, Rizal? I mean, we've, we're just kind of like focused on me for a bit. Because I, 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 uh, I could talk a little bit about how I'm seeing some parallels. So that was really great. Yeah. We talked uh, yesterday. Yeah, I don't mind sharing a couple of these slides. I feel like I'm rambling and I've had a lot of coffee, so. <laughs> Thanks for sharing space, Wayne. I'm gonna do, would you mind popping out of the um, share screen really quick? And then I do, whoops, oh no, I accidentally pressed something else. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna go to my slideshow really quick and I can share with you. Um, I wanna do just like a quick rundown on like, I'm a process-based oriented person. And so I wanna end with this returning Filipino project, but I just wanna give people a glimpse of like how I got there. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about returning Filipino, um, but what I saw in Wayne's work was this connection to objects. And so I'm gonna start off by just sharing a couple of these objects, symbolic objects um, that kind of lead me to the box. And so thinking about the boat thinking about what blue means to me, thinking about what mirrors mean to me and how all these, um, how all these materials kind of communicate in a really specific way. Uh, the paper boat is a very familiar uh, object. I feel like at some point everyone's made it before. And I love the fact by changing it and putting it in a different context totally transforms it. Um, I had this project uh, with these life vests in an air, they displayed actually in an airplane and sewn into the uh, life vest, said uh, te amo, um, another phrase, ingatka, uh, which is like to take care. So these are phrases that people say goodbye to each other. And then I think what really hit the nail um, for me is uh, I went to the Filipino American Festival, uh, I think it was last year. Yeah, just last year, and I sewed all of these um, these stuffed animals of uh, of bungus, which is the national fish of the Philippines. And what happened was, is I had the intention to go that I was trying to make extra money. I was like, hey, these are five bucks. Anybody wants these? And people started coming up to me crying and saying, I know what that fish is. I know where that's from. And um, especially when I it was the grandmothers where they were like oh my gosh, I feel like I'm at home. And I just, I ended up giving everything away because I was so impacted by all the stories that people shared with me that they were like, uh, do I buy this? And I was like, actually, if you wanna just tell me a story, just take one, um, take five, <laughs> because the stories are really, really great. Um, and so it made me think of my grandmother and how does my grandmother um, internalize the separation? and she does it through the box. Um, and so I'll just share a little bit about the Bollock buy-in box if you don't know about it. It's a huge industry. 
uh, Filipinos in America all over have um, been sending these boxes back home, right, um, to their uh, prospective families. And it's a huge, huge industry. Um, and something that you should know is out of all of the businesses for LBC, two of them are in San Diego. So that is a huge indicator for me that there are tons of people dealing with the Philam diaspora here. And so what I did was I started making a call. I just started interviewing people. And then um, the objects changed, right? I realized in the objects by packing these boxes, it didn't matter what the objects were. So I started photographing the, box, uh, the objects the way my grandma would pack them. And so uh, if you've packed a ballot buy in box before, um, there's a science that your elders will not, you can't fight them on it, but they like to separate things to make sure that everybody gets their own slice of the pie. Um, so this is an example. Um, what you don't know, it's just a block of cheese. <laughs> um, but my grandma sent me home all the way from the Philippines with like 20 of them, all prepackaged and like labeled for each family member. And um, I tell you, um, it means a lot when, when it arrives. Right, so um, I, I really love what Wayne's talking about, how these objects really um, take a life on for itself. And so then it made me start to think, how do I deal with it? And I realized I go to Tijuana a lot because I realize um, now that um, Tijuana makes me feel like I'm in the Philippines. And you could see really clearly in this division of the photo, um, one side on the left is Tijuana, the right is Philippines, and as I keep making these photographs, the line really disappears. And so I think what I learned was that I don't have to be in two places. Uh, I could be in one. And part of that is this healing from the Filipino um, American diaspora. So my grandma deals it with, with it from the box. And now I deal with it with my own box, <laughs> like this gallery, um, where I'm trying to go home and find a connection to home, just like I think my grandma does. And then I just wanted to end with this outside view where you could see um, my grandma from the window. And she looks like she's, it looks as though she's looking over to Mexico. So if you saw the other side of the street. Um, so yeah, I, I feel tons of parallels um, to Wayne's story. And I just keep thinking um, the reason why I worked on this project is because I want to feel their bliss. Um, so these two women that I saw at Phil Amfest, there was a kind of bliss and a trans uh, teleportation to home that I would love to embody. Um, and so that's what the, um, the Balak Bayan project is uh, for me. So I know we're running out of time, so I'll share the link with uh, Alessandra, but um, yeah, definitely check out um, that video. And if anyone has a Balak Bayan story they would like to share with me, I would love to hear it. I want to hear the uh, the uh, onion story again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you check out the video um, for the Balak Bayan boxes, something that's really funny is uh, someone's in someone's confessional. I'm calling it a confessional because um, some sometimes Balak Bayan stories could be embarrassing, and if you've packed one before, you, you you feel me. But he was like, "My aunt wanted onions," and it's like there's a market in the Philippines, and you could just buy onions like at the market in the Philippines, but that's not what it's about, right? He knows that his aunt needs to feel loved and that there's a distance between the two of them. And if it costs, and if it's the cost of an onion, it's the cost of an onion. It doesn't matter how much it is or what it is. The point is, is there's two people separated and they're looking for a way to feel connection. Yeah, I thought that was so beautiful. I mean, especially because you know it's it's going to cost so much more, <laughs> you know, to to do all this and everything. But just you know, I kind of even pictured her receiving that box of onions and just you know feeling loved. And I, I thought that was just really beautiful. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Yeah, I would I would love to hear uh, like questions if anybody has questions. Um, yeah. I'm so interested. Uh, my background too is teaching, so I'm like, what is everyone thinking? <laughs> I, um, you know, I would love to um, th make that connection with family, community. I mean, result in the boxes. It's more informal in a sense. You know, you make these boxes and you send them home, connect. But then the altars are also a way to connect also with 
family and the idea of remembering somebody who you love and you kind of you it's also the idea of teleportation that their souls would come back and kind of visit and so i even though it might seem at us a stretch but i think there are definitely you know this the importance of family and community that come out in both of your works um and you know connecting with others and the human element and i think that's also why it's so wonderful to see how when you, for example, when Rizal visits uh, Tijuana, you feel home because that's how I felt when I visited, um, you know, certain parts of Hong Kong that were more traditional. And, um, and that also talks about our humanity and, and kind of you bring, bring that up in your, in your work. Um, and I think that's one of the, in a world that is becoming seemingly becoming more divisive, I think that the way that both of you as artists um, make these connections with others is just so healing and so essential. Also, I really, I, I, I liked how, um, like Rosenthal's, I mean, it was definitely like, you know, family and history focused, but it's still in all a shrine or direction. You know, it, it's still, you know, a focal point of, of like meditation. And mine was more exterior, you know, but they all kind of come together as the same intention or the same drive, you know, to go forward and, and, and study and learn and connect with, with other humans. And uh, yeah, so I, I really like that uh, connection of similarity. Yeah, I just want to, oh my God, result, just like, so something that I've talked about, like with my fiction writers, because I also write, is that I never, I never knew that I didn't have to write about white characters or white stories. So seeing your art has that same effect on me where it's like, this is an everyday thing that's part of our culture. And you're like exposing its poetry, you know? Yeah. You're like exposing its visual poetry. Just how like the everyday, everyday rituals or everyday ceremony, the act of putting a box together for someone away from you is so moving. And like, I don't think I ever really I don't know why I feel like emotional right now, <laughs> but I just never thought about that the way I would see my mom patter around the house or pitter patter around the house, just putting all these things together. And I'm thinking, how is this going to fit in this box? So I love that. And it makes me think of how you really bring in our culture into what you do. So you're giving away the bangus is like, to like that's so Filipino. You just, it's just something you want to make sure everybody has a seat at the table, like to me being Filipino or being part of cultures like that, that's equity in action, you know? It's just like, just, is everyone, did everyone get something to eat? Are you gonna have a piece of my artwork? Can you tell me a story? I'll tell you mine. It's just amazing. And so the class that I brought today is uh, my learning community with, and we're using that term kapwa, you know, that indigenous uh, concept of, you know, I'm who I'm connected to. So also you're seeing like, it's just like wherever you are, you're just kind of reflected in that in other people who are there. So the, the part you, about you talking about TJ being so similar to being in the Philippines, I finally realized that when I visited the Philippines, like Metro Manila. So I don't know, I just wanted to say, I just, I, I don't know, you're, you're making it okay to be Philippine. I don't know if that's like a weird thing to say, but it just, yeah, I, I actually really, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll share an experience because I think um, narratives and stories are super important, right? It's, that's the way that we could uh, rewrite the story. Um, but I come from a background that's very academic. Um, I am usually the only person of color, usually definitely the only Filipino in a lot of the rooms that I'm in. And um, I'll share in one um, um, in one lecture, I was asked to like share some pieces um, and uh, the other artists, they brought, you know, ve very beautiful, beautiful prints. And I showed up with these like stuffed animals <laughs> and, um, you know, at the end of the night, uh, they asked us to give them away. And someone actually returned one to me saying, um, you know, I feel like this might be more meaningful for someone else. And I feel like it might be wrong for me to keep it. And that made me realize, um, the stories are not heard. Um, and uh, right after that person gave me back my piece, 
um, actually Carmela Prudencio, who was um, the curator for Almost Home, she asked for it. She asked for the fish and she said, actually, that means a lot to me. Like, can I have it? <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Thank you for like helping me get through that experience basically. And um, it's very common. It's very common to not be able to share the story and to be in spaces um, where it's kind of hard to share it. So it felt very good. Actually, Alana was in the room as well, Wayne. And I just thought, yeah. what, like, it's a great space to have that kind of support because it's not easy. It's not. And if it looks easy, it's only because I've been doing it for a long time. But I tell you, I'm probably just as scared as all of the beginning students or any student in general. Thank you, Rizal. That was wonderful. I, there's one student, Rico, has had his hand, hand up. He wanted to ask a question. Um, it was more of a statement. Um, I really liked um, Rizal's, um her art and the picture she's shown. I relate to it a whole lot. What, what being in the military, being deployed for nine months, we'll have um, a lot of the soldiers will have um, lockers and in our lockers we'll have pictures and sometimes our house and how things are going from letters. And we line up through our lockers. And then also with the box, we get care packages from our family and friends and yeah, everything you show is like, it, it brings, brings me back to when I was deployed. And like, you know, I feel exactly, you know, what you're trying to portray. Thank you. Yeah, my dad was um, in the military. He used to be gone six months of the year. And I think I probably learned that from him. So uh, I have a, a huge box of tapes and he would literally just talk to me like on these tapes and he, he would send me like a four hour long tape of just like I'm looking at the water and I'd be like dad what are you coming home <laughs> um but yeah I think that it's a need right we live in a migrant community and we need to tell each other how we heal from the distance it's important mm -hmm. there was there was also a question for Wayne from Rigo um, and he was asking on the chat, you've been all over the world and interacted with various cultures. What were similar themes or something that each culture had in common? Um, actually, I, I, I'd say the most common thread, because a lot of the times I'm going to distressed areas, I'm going to war zones um, to, do, to work on different projects. But the, the most common thing that I came across was just this connection to community and family, um, far more than what I've witnessed here in a lot of the U.S. Um, the uh, like um, was it a year ago? I was traveling with a migrant caravan um, from Guatemala to Tijuana, um, doing a photo project, and their greatest commodity, the thing that they were the most passionate about was family and connection to family and just helping each other. When I was in the Palestinian territories, it was exactly the same. When I was in the Syrian refugee camps, um, exactly the same. Yeah, you know, that was like their greatest treasure. It wasn't like cool tennis shoes. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was, there wasn't like a lot of like cultural influences or American cultural influences. It was more about just the core of community, family, and connection. And, and that's where you're know, making these cameras that are made for them to you know, work with um, refugees. That's when they saw it was part of family and part of their history. So I was invited in. And it was just really, it was really beautiful to, to feel that and connect and see that around the world, so much compassion and empathy and caring for other humans they don't know, but in, you know, so much connection with their immediate family too. Great, thank you. I'm trying to see if there's any other question. Um, you know, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the power of the image of, of a per person you know, in a photograph. And of course, in, in, a, in a traditional, like Dia de los Muertos altar, that's a centerpiece. Yeah. Uh, whether that image is a photograph or sometimes, you know, they could be painted, but photographs have this 
there's power to them. And, um, and you know, there's also some cultures that don't want to be photographed because you're capturing yeah. their soul. Um, on the other hand, there's also now the, our ability to take pictures all the time with our smartphones and how that has also changed, you know, the way that those photographs um, are utilized. And, you know, I'm always, for example, very careful about asking my teens if I can post their picture because I want to be respectful of that. And so I'm, I'm trying to think about both of you as photographers who capture the images, you know, whether it's as a way of remembrance, like in a shrine or as a way of, you know, like your grandmother's picture in the front. So, so those issues with um, both uh, wanting, wanting to celebrate that person, but also being respectful of, of presenting their image. So I, I was wondering about that. Yeah, the, um, well, being in like in, in like Lesbos and different places, um, you know, I've seen photographers come in and people shy away from cameras all the time. And when I do a photograph, it's actually a collaboration with the person I'm photographing. For one thing, you know, since it's a pinhole camera, I need to connect with them. They, you know, understand the camera, but exposures could be like a two minute exposure. So it's this piece of time of us connecting and working together. There's, um, there is another project I did. It was called um, Untouchable. And it was a camera that actually has HIV positive blood that pumps through the camera and then in front of the lens. And then so all the images are toned by the blood itself. Uh, but the exposure times ended up really long because of the blood between the film and the subject. So, and I only photograph people with HIV and AIDS around the world with it. So I would photograph and it would be a two minute exposure. And there's times me and the person I'm photographing are just both crying. You know, we're having this collaborative connection and these emotions just kind of going through us. And so it, it's, it's really kind of a different experience than any other photography I've had because it is a collaboration. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from them they're participating in a communication we both want to create together. So it's a little bit different. Yeah, that was a great question, Alessandra, um, because I never, so I started documenting my grandmother when I turned 30, that was six years ago, and um, I never asked her. I just started doing it because at first it just looks like, you know, your grandkids taking pictures of you and she, that doesn't matter to her. And, um, and then uh, when I got offered to show the work summer, I, I called her and I said, Hey grandma, um, I'm going to put your photo in a gallery. And she was like, why, why? And I, she was like, show me which one. And, I, and she was like, Oh, the ugly one? Why the ugly one? And I was like, no, no, grandma, there's like a story. Like I want to tell them, you know, like why I think you're important. And then she said, and this is very powerful, why would anyone want to know anything about me? Um, so it was really important for me to show my grandmother um, the power of what it is like to show someone's portrait and someone's story. And so um, something I'll share is a uh, one of my my dad's like second cousin so this is family but not someone that I, i'm in touch with um a lot she she messaged me one day and she said hey um i know you're raised daughter i just wanted to let you know my son goes to college and he was taking this race and ethnicity class and he saw one of your photos on the screen he took a picture of it and he said mom why does this lady look like our grandmother and I smiled and I said, because they're related. And I was like, isn't that awesome? That, and I called my grandma and I said, grandma, look at this picture. You're in someone's class. And she was like, why? And I was, and she's like, are you there? And I was like, I'm not even there. And I was like, it's working grandma, <laughs> it's working. And she was like, am I famous? <laughs> and I was like, you might be grandma. <laughs> I am working on it. <laughs> and she was like, for my story. And I was like, it's important. Um, I need you to know. And so it was great uh, to see her reactions. And I showed her pictures of the gallery and people taking pictures with her picture. And she was like, like, super like, why is this happening? And I was like, 
because your story is important, Grandma. I can't tell you like uh, any other good reason. <laughs> Great. Um, I can't remember. How much time do we have? Well, the class goes until 11. Um, oh. so, I, so we do have time for a few more questions. If mm -hmm. people have other questions, and you can either write them in the, on the chat or you can, um, you know, raise your hand and unmute yourselves. Um, if we have a moment, I just thought, because uh, we have 20 minutes, I could do this on one more one minute video. And I thought that the un to hear the onions um would be like uh maybe funny for everybody so, yeah that was great yes let me pull that up really quick <laughs> okay so here we go um if you want to hear the onion story <laughs> onion story so i think last time she sent something she sent onions in the box and that's just like in my head, I was like, I would never think to send onions, but she also sends once a month. So she sends smaller boxes, but I think it's a much more meaningful box because it's actually necessities that she sends because she constantly communicates with her sisters and she gets them what they need rather than indulgement. I think my dad still does his grocery shopping at Seafood City and just right three doors down is where you can send your boxes. So, and so it's a kind of, it's kind of a way to help their families, um, you know, and um, as Filipinos, we are very family centric and, you know, we kind of <laughs> help each other out in that sense. And that's kind of a way of giving back to, especially your parents. And it's kind of one thing that you're taught is that, you know, if you're working overseas, you got to help your parents out. You're going to help your family out. And, you know, that's a way for, it's a way for you to say, kind of say, A, you're still thinking of them, and B, to kind of help them out financially, however way you can. Pasalubong is something you bring with you. So you, the person, are with the presence. Balikbayan is usually just the box in itself. It's kind of like, you you're represented by the box they don't get any gifts from you after a while they start thinking that you don't care <laughs> there's lots of different levels but yeah um, I just wanted to make sure that people got the chance to see that, to just kind of see the depth to you in which... Um, the onion reference. Yeah, the yeah. onion reference and just like what the boxes mean. I mean, I, I love what he says. Essentially, the box is coming in place of me, right? Yeah. So everything inside the box is, uh, um, yeah, it's everything I want them to feel. I miss them. I love them. I need you to see this thing that I made. I need you to taste this thing that I eat, you know? Um, so yeah, whoever made the box buy and service, thank you. <laughs> and I like it's like everything in the box is just, it, it's little pieces of remembrance of the person. And you know, little pieces, and it just, it's a little demonstration that you know them and you love them and connected with them. And you know, and everything has thought, you know, that relates to them in the box. So it's, uh, it's really special. Yeah, you made you just made me remember, uh, Alessandra, was something that you said, like, because uh, we were talking about altars. Um, a, a traditional Filipino home always has an altar, and um, I'll share a lot of things from the Balak Bayan box end up there, right? Little trinkets or little things that got put into the box, and if it's not edible, <laughs> it usually ends up right where the altar is, right? Because that's where you put your family photos or your family anything that reminds you of your family right and so something that was really special to me was when I went to the Philippines I started going to the Philippines and I had met some family I'd never met um, that I would see at their altars a little photo of my face or a little bead or a necklace that I had given them and I thought wow 
I'm like important in these people's lives, even if I'm far away, even if they had never even met me, they just knew like I was my mother's daughter. And they're like, that's who she is. And she's part of our family and we haven't met her, but she's got a little place in our altar. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's also, you just made me think that would be an awesome project to have everybody photograph their altars <laughs> in their home <laughs> to see what they look like and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, we, we're asking the college community to either, uh, I think uh, Professor Darello's students are gonna be working on a Balik Bayan and uh, project. And then my uh, Chicano art class is doing a miniature cajita, a small box that is gonna be an altar to somebody, dedicated to somebody. Either some of them are doing it more personal, a family member, and then others are doing it to a group of people uh, and others are doing to a person from history. So it's, um, so it's gonna be a mix, but you're right that there's other cultures. My friend, again, I mentioned from Hong Kong, there's also a lot of Chinese have a small, you know, shrine, you know, with, or usually I remember like oranges or other fruits that are, you know, an, as an offering. Uh, and there was one question here on the chat for Wayne about the Santeria altars and the shrines and how they connect in your or, or how would that inspired your work um well just growing up around them um and like i said the a lot of the shrines um are made from what you personally connect with um there was there were some shrines that were just very specific like by the front door you always have an alegua and your know, alegua would be there and you you would um have the cigar you would have you know different you know the rum uh, different artifacts for Elegua, and there's a certain time of month where you do a ceremony for Elegua. Um, you do different ceremonies for your leques, your necklaces that you have, um, and also a ceremony for um, the Arisha that rules your head. And so, you know, I just grew up with that around, and and that, and it, it and it did it completely transformed into. Um, taking my altars on the road pretty much and the cameras being my altars and my connection and my focal point um, yeah so and it still has a big influence on me today and I you know and it's like I remember because a lot of good uh, a lot of people who practice Santeria also you know they're Catholic so you end up going to church and I remember going to church too and it's like I was wondering why I, you know when I was really young some people would Go over to the holy water and just fill it with another you know bring home a bunch of holy water and a lot of it was because uh there were santa santeria practitioners and they'd actually use it for their home rituals and the church you know in, in east l.a was just like eh, just kind of turn your head to a lot of it and and uh let it fly but uh yeah Did that answer the question yes i think so and uh, there was one another person who has their hand up carlos Carlos, if you want to ask your question. Yes. Uh, first of all, th I want to thank both of you for sharing your amazing projects. I think it's very inspirational as we can all really relate and connect to this. I myself am a fan of world traveler. You know, I've been traveling a lot and in different places, whether India, China, or so on, I've been able to connect great however i do want to ask you guys a question as travel photographers what your biggest obstacle is as a photographer you know in terms of you know finding inspiration or motivation or like new ideas that say hey you know what i think this really highlights so much um in just an image that can resemble you know the lives of many or just something very symbolic for you guys so what do you guys find as your biggest obst uh, uh, obstacle as a photographer and thank you Zell, you want to go first yeah that's a that's a great question yeah. thank you so much carlos um i would say um, my most difficult uh task as a photographer has a lot to do um with what Professor Berilio is saying is um, accepting that my story is worth hearing. 
um, or acknowledging that it is happening <laughs> even. Um, I think that um, it, my family background is like, okay, kind of like, shh, like we got here, like don't raise, don't, don't rock any boats, you know? So um, for those of you that know me, I'm uh, a little risky and uh, I let him feisty. <laughs> And so that's dangerous for my parents where they're like, we told you to be quiet. We don't want anyone to know that we're here <laughs> um, kind of thing. Um, so I have that embedded in my personality. Um, yeah, like I said, if people know me, they know I have the tendency to put other people first. I put my students first. I put so many things before me. Um, and so for me, my art practice is a, it's the liberation, right? To be able to say, um, outside of all the things that I care about, um, the things that happen to me are important. Um, and we don't hear that every day, right? Nobody really asks you on a daily basis, uh, like um, what's important to you. It's not a question that people ask, like how people say, how are you doing? You know, that's a normal question you ask on a, on a, normal, on a, on a regular basis. But I love like, yeah, just like, um, I love that part. And then I would say the technique part, um, I would say my most challenging thing, you made me think of this funny story. Um, I went to Mexico and I was shooting film and I was really, I think I had just got out of grad school. So I bought like the most film, I think it was like the last of my student loan. <laughs> so I'm like gonna take all this film with me. I literally filled a backpack, like a backpacker's backpack of film with like three pairs, like a three shirts and like two jeans or something like that. And I got to the airport uh, and I don't really speak great Spanish. And they were like, you could only bring 12 rolls. And I was like, uh, how do I say that this film is expensive without making myself a target <laughs> for danger or anything like that? And they're basically telling me like, you can't bring this film, you can't cross it. And I was like, this is like a couple thousand dollars worth of film. I'm not leaving it. Like I have to stay in the airport. And I was literally in the airport for like six or seven hours. And then if you know, if you've traveled a lot, you know, this kind of like a bomb detection kind of thing where they like take a cotton and they like wipe it. They had to do it to every single film. They made me take every single film out of the box, out of the plastic. And I was like trying to explain, someone actually took some of the film out and I was like, it's light sensitive. Like that film is gone now. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was a, that a technical difficulties. Um, bring more than one camera, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Cause I also thought, oh man, if I, if I, if I only, if I only had my digital camera, then I wouldn't be risking this like, oh gosh, 12 rolls and then throw away all these other rolls kind of thing. So um, there's a emotional side and then a, a technical thing. <laughs> um, one of my, I, 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 well, I'm going around with a weird art camera to really interesting places. So that's always been a little difficult. Um, one of the more, one of the biggest difficulties um, besides carrying around a 40 pound camera in really weird terrain and a ton of film and a ton of gear um, has been um, border crossings. Um, partly because my, you know, my Arabic isn't that great. My Spanish isn't that great. You know, it's like whatever, you know, it's not that great, but um, I've had like three hour interrogations in border crossings sometimes because, you know, I have a camera that has all these weird things in it. And like the, uh, one of the cameras I travel quite a bit with has all these bullet shells in the bottom. So they want to know why I have bullet shells, which is, I guess, you know, when you're going through an airport is a good question to ask. But um, so that's one of the main um, issues. The, the big issue I'd say is language. Cause also I'm going to different places where, you know, I'm a white guy showing up American so there's already this uh, predetermined um, idea of who I am. Um, one thing I've done to kind of help with that is generally when I go to like Lesbos or different places, I volunteer with an NGO and I do, you know, humanitarian work for quite some time, way before I even bring out the camera. So I end up knowing the real situation on, on the ground there. I end up meeting people and connecting with people and really get to know them uh, before that I ask them if they want to collaborate on a project to tell their story. Um, so it's, it's 
it's a little bit different technique because a lot of you know photographers they want to go into some place take 2,000 photos and be out the next day. Um, and they really don't get a true sense of the story, the people, the situation, the politics, the everything that's going on. And so um, I guess that's a little bit of advice and, uh, advice and um, a story of what the, the hardest things are in, in doing this work. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Wayne, because um... That's really important to me also like at the place where I work at the Aja project and something that made me um, that you reminded me of is so like in my in my in my documentation of my grandmother in the town where she lives it's called Suniguela San all of the children saw me and so every day I'd be like filming my grandmother and I'd look behind me and I'm like grandma there's like 30 kids following us <laughs> And she's like, what do they want? Tell them we don't have money. And I'm like, they don't want money. <laughs> they want to learn how to do photo. <laughs> yeah. And so um, bless my organization, I hit them up and say, hey, uh, we need cameras. And so I managed to get uh, kind of like Wallach Vian style. My friend Joe met up with my friend Zimar and then we managed to get the cameras from San Diego <laughs> to the Philippines. Um, and uh, I got to like teach them while I was working on this documentary with my grandma. Oh, cool. So they nice. would ask me like, well, what are you shooting? Oh, I'm shooting my grandma's house, you know? Like, I wanna know where she lives. I wanna know, I wanna know that um, when I have kids, I could show them where my grandma lives. They're like, cool, we're gonna shoot our home too. We're gonna go photograph our home. And then they come back with, but, well, what are your memories? You know, and, and so, um, and now, you know, especially during quarantine, what's been really great is, uh, it's called Photo Club. They, they named it themselves. <laughs> and so uh, they still contact me via social media, via Facebook. They say, hey, uh, they call me Ateme. And so they're like, Ateme, we made this photo. Like, look at what we're doing. And so we still get to kind of have class. And uh, what's great is uh, my grandma is stateside. So when they take pictures, I could say, hey, grandma, look who's taking pictures for you. So just in case you miss home, the kids Aww. remember. Right, and so it's this cycle, right? It's really great to know that um, something that may have worked for me worked for someone else. And that, uh, yeah, like seeing my grandma, like someone seeing my grandma in class without me there, it's like priceless, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I love, I just love that participatory collaborative part of it, right? Cause I think that's what's hard about uh, storytelling. Who's telling the story? And a lot of people don't ask that, right? We always pay attention to the story being told. Um, but I start to, I'm starting to pay attention, like who's the, who's the person who wrote that story? Or who's yeah. the person that funded that project? You know, those are things that I'm starting to think about because those are the people I want to know, like the people yeah. we should know, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, being in, in, in especially war zones, you know, you, you, I really look at every image now completely different, you know, and seeing how photographers come in and just take and take and take, you know, and and knowing that the story can be completely different. So, you know, I like what you grew. <laughs> you have your own little team now of, uh, of uh, documenting home. That's great. Um, in my, in my, selfishly, I'm like, please, like, photograph. I want to see what's going on. And uh, it, it, it's radiating, you know. So these are just the kids, uh, the trash workers in, in the town, too. We're like, what is she doing? Like, why is she like, why is she showing our town? They're like, we we better clean up. We got to clean up. Like, we got to make the town cleaner. And then they would show me, like, look at us. Like Saturday morning, we're cleaning, Riz. We just want to let you know it looks beautiful here. And I'm like, that's great. Like, it's like sparking other kinds of community collaborations and improvements, which is it's like wakes going out from the pebble you you know you dropped in the pond. You know, and it's it's really beautiful. Great, great. Um, yeah, so, uh, Alessandra, sorry. <laughs> so we only have like five minutes left. Um, we did have a question uh, on Facebook for Rizel from Alana, and, and she was asking that your work is very personal and cultural specific. Have you ever had challenges navigated with audiences that are not familiar with Filipino culture? Yeah, um, that's actually a great question. And I know that Alana feels me um, on this is that sometimes 
um, when I get invited to do events, I, I like to critically think, am I getting invited for my work? Am I getting invited for my name? Am I getting invited for the color of my skin? Am I getting invited as a teacher? So I feel like I have this intersection of several um, identities and um, like something that's really interesting and, I, and I'm going through this myself is as I go through my website, do, does all my work have to be cultural? Because that's not the only thing that I think about. And so I have been in situations where we're like, hey, this is a Filipino American uh, exhibition. And then I show something and they're like, but how does this show that you're Filipino? And I'm like, well, I made it, right? Like <laughs> that, that should be part of it. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but there's no like sun or stars. It's not red, yellow, and blue. It's like, there's no identifying things that make it look specifically Filipino. And so those are some questions that I'm, I'm starting to ask myself. And, I, and I'll admit, um, like Carmela's show at the front really made me start to think about that, right? Like how, how is um, a Filipino American show being portrayed and is that what people expect? And I think that really falls in, in alignment with me when I think always about like how to re redefine the narrative, right? And so, um, yeah, like does it have to have these very cultural specific objects and things like that? Uh, does it have to be in Tagalog? Uh, those kinds of questions or uh, does it make any of us feel more or less Filipino? Actually, sometimes it does, but that's not right. Um, I don't feel that that's right. And I feel that, um, yeah, I think that art is at the root always about the idea that you're thinking about. And I guess that's just what I'm thinking about right now. It's hard not to think about it, especially in the political climate um, today and what people are going through from all the borders, all the different kinds of borders, the visible ones and the invisible ones um, that, uh, yeah, for me, it's mainly about the healing, I guess. And so whatever way we can do the healing, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rizal. Um, So we're, we're close to 11, and I wanted to just ask if, you got, if either of you have uh, closing remarks, um, and also if you have any, anything that you want to highlight that's coming up that you're w working on that you might want to invite people to. Um, look at or, or participate in, and, and then we'll just wrap it up. You want to do some updates, Wayne? <laughs> what was that? Do you have any updates you want to share? Um, not the moment. I mean, I, I had three shows and lectures all set up, but COVID erased that to 2021. So we're still working on dates. Um, I have a new website that it will be, uh, I think it's up I'm not really sure. Um, I have somebody working on it actually right at this moment, but uh, it's waynemartinbelger.com. Um, and it has, a I've, uh, it has a lot of the other work, a lot of the travel work that I uh, talked about, but I didn't show. And I think that's a bit. Oh, and um, if my daughter's watching in San Francisco, happy birthday, honey. <laughs> but uh, that's about it. And also it was a uh, really, amazing connecting with you and and I, I like that you know, our work is so completely different but i loved finding how so many roots are so similar and uh so this was really cool i really enjoyed this so thank you very much and thank you um, alessandra and everybody else on the crew thank you yeah it, it's great to um meet wayne alessandra thank you for bringing that all together and your team. Um, Alana is a, a frequent visitor to my class. And so I've seen Wayne's work through the periphery. So it's great to share a, a space with you. Um, I, I do want to share and, and um, forgive me if this is a shameless plug, but uh, I am looking for people to work with me at the Aja project. So I thought I would mention if you like what you saw today, I feel like I work at the Aja project because I am one of the students um, and what we provide, I feel like is this kind of critical thinking and ability to heal. 
and share your stories. So if you're interested in working with me, I would love to meet you and I would love to have you on my team. <laughs> so um, that's one. And then I know Professor De Rillo is doing um, the Bollock buy-in boxes. I would love to hear your stories. So I'm gonna forward her a number and I hope that you like, keep in contact with me. I want to see the projects. I want to see the story or hear the stories, read them, however you do them. And I'd love to be someone that could offer feedback. Um, I want to hear all the stories. <laughs> Thank you. I also wanted to ask Professor Durillo if she had any closing remarks. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for um, well, for Alessandra for bringing us all together. Um, I, I don't know, I'm embarrassed that I don't, you know, keep up all the time with like the arts, even though I love it so much. But if you hadn't, you know, thought of these two artists, I just, I, I would have been so sad, <laughs> like sadder than usual. Um, so I, I love this format. It was so awesome to see you guys interviewing each other and then you know, finally talking to each other. I don't think the students knew that. I think we're about to bring that up, but that was really nice. And I don't know, I feel like your project is so inspiring. I wish I had myself and Alessandra as professors when I was a student and Rizal too. Um, I just feel like I would have done way better in school or something, but yeah. So thank you so much for your, um, your wisdom and your kindness and your generosity for spending this time with us. We can't wait to see our students' projects and share them with you. Can we see them? Yes, we can. We will, yeah. <laughs> we'll extend an invitation when we present the projects. So you can come back and see some of their projects. That would be really cool. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I guess that's, we're a little bit over. I wanted to thank everybody. And I also wanted to thank the quiet uh, um, people that, that uh, of our staff, that, that my colleagues that have been helping us so much, um, doing so much work for this event. So uh, Caitlin Choi and Jennifer Armour, uh, I have been helping us and plan and, you know, big contributions. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank Wayne and uh, Rizelle, uh, of course, Professor Durillo for, for collaborating, but Wayne and Rizelle, I just feel so honored um, to know you. And um, there's nothing that brings me more delight than bringing and highlighting, you know, the wonderful artists and, and the side of, you know, activism and engaging with communities is just for me, such an essential part of what art is. And so, so I'm so, I was so excited to bring you to, um, to speak to the students and also to the broader audience that's listening to this on the Facebook Live. Um, and so thank you from, we, we all thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being with us this morning. And, um, and I also wanted to um, let you know that we are going to be continuing some more programming throughout the semester. Our gallery is closed, but we're still working and we're still figuring out ways to engage people through art. And so uh, just follow us on Facebook or if you want to receive email announcements of what's coming up, you can type your email on the chat and I will add you to our email list. Um, coming up, we have some workshops with uh, Gloria Muriel, who's going to be doing a mask making workshop. And later in the year, we're gonna have Michelle Montjoy doing a workshop for holiday ornaments. And we also have our drive-through exhibition. It's gonna be an outdoor exhibition of COVID, but with uh, representing 50 artists from the San Diego region and curated by the museum studies class. So, um, so that's, that's all for today, but I just virtual hug to everybody. You know, I wish we, we could be together in the same room. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Have a great world experience and live projects ahead. You too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Coppola, for being so awesome. Yes, thank you. Bye.